Okay, I guess it's time to start. Um, yeah, well, welcome to a Developer's Guide to, to Free Open Source Licenses. Uh, and in a way, a little bit about background about this talk. Uh, it's in a way a reaction to uh, a talk I've seen a while ago. It has been a lightning talk, and which gave incredibly bad advice, I thought, about uh, open source licenses. So it, it was about creating your own license in a way. And uh, during this talk, I, I like to establish that, for example, that is, is quite a bad idea usually. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, basic idea behind this talk. Uh, and first, a little bit of background about myself as a person, because um, usually uh, it, it's not very common for developers to talk about legal stuff. Um, so yeah, I've been a, a software engineer, a developer in, in specifically the area of open source software for now about 10 years. Uh, at some point, uh, I've been working as a community coordinator for a larger open source project, uh, which usually involves uh, people coming to you and asking uh, about really anything that has to do with open source and uh, about licenses. That's that's certainly part of it. Um, I've done some uh, floss recommendations and consulting for uh, for companies and finally uh, it's something I'm still doing that I'm uh, in a few groups of the Aperia Foundation. The Aperia Foundation, if you have never heard about it, it's um, a legal entity or so it's in a non-profit organization as a legal entity for a set of open source projects uh, very much like the Free Software Foundation or the Apache Foundation. So um, in the air, uh, I'm an incubating uh, incubation member mentor of the, there. So uh, I'm helping new projects to get started to get the, the basics right and to get uh, integrated in this uh, organization. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have a strict legal background, but I still have to somehow deal with all of this. And uh, that's a little bit what this talk is about. So, yeah, this is a very common phrase, I guess, uh, if you've ever searched for anything related to to uh, legal stuff on the internet, you will certainly find that uh, Basically, every post starts with, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but... Um, and uh, in a way, of course, that's, that's true. I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not supposed to be a lawyer. And I guess most of you aren't, aren't lawyers, but uh, developers or someone interested in open source. And so you, we don't have to be perfect. And that's not the goal of this talk to, I don't know, give you a degree in law. Uh, but that simply won't work because we all, you can study law if you want to, but uh, yeah. But still it's, uh, it's something that I would like to say that uh, I'm not trying to, to talk any nonsense here. So um, you can still basically do uh, something which I as a developer would call a, a best effort approach. So at least we can try to avoid critical situations and make relatively good decisions in the first place so that uh, it doesn't turn out that uh, at each uh, corner there is, uh, is a critical problem uh, which turns up regarding the, uh, the legal issues of, of open source. So we can already do a, a lot of good stuff by just making some a smart decision based on a little bit of knowledge. And this is really uh, what what this talk is about. So you, as a developer, should be able to kind of know uh, when you deal with, with licenses. So uh, I have a project which has this license. What other libraries, for example, can I use? And another thing uh, is, of course, uh, being able to select a license for a project you start, uh, which well, it's something that, that a developer usually does, or often does. Not always, but, but often does. And so uh, having a little bit of background knowledge, is, uh, knowledge about this really makes sense. Um, but I also like to stress something, and there are a lot of special cases, of course, and if there really is a special case, uh, don't necessarily try to be smart, but uh, 
go ahead and, and ask a lawyer because, uh, well, they, they've started, they say, uh, have a lot more knowledge. I mean, we, we are developers and um, I don't know, if you have a, a business model based on integrating some proprietary license with open source and you aren't really sure how these, these licenses interact with each other. I mean, you can take the risk and, and build your business model on your knowledge but at some, uh, and for example, uh, like this, um, it kind of makes sense to to uh, get legal advice. So, um, really, this is about a best effort approach, um, and I think you can cover a lot with that. Uh, it's not uh, about any really special cases. So, uh, we try to establish basically uh, some basic knowledge. Um, and the first thing I've uh, I want to talk about is uh, why do we need this license anyway. Um, and the funny thing is that uh, when talking with developers about licenses and about uh, how should I uh, approach licensing when it comes to, to projects and stuff like that, um, a lot of people say, well, I don't really care. And this is very often the case, especially if you have a smaller project, then I don't really care how it's used. So uh, if people want this, I, I'll just put it online so people can find it useful. Um, why do you need a license? And uh, the, the concept of having no license is something that people sometimes think uh, means that everyone can use it. But that's not necessarily true because um, you can have and, and often do have uh, some restrictions on uh, on stuff that just someone put online uh, because of some usually local laws and so uh, really if there there's something online which doesn't have a license this usually means that you can't use it at all in all in any project um, so, if there's a, li uh, a library, for example, I can't just include that in my project. Um, there can be consequences of that. Even, and that's the the funny thing here, as uh, a lot of these uh, projects without a license, people often intend to make it open, but they really don't. So, yeah, having a license definitely makes sense. So. Um, and uh, if you think a little bit about licenses, uh, then you, you're wondering what does this, this license uh, thing entail in, in the end. And really, if you think about it, uh, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is uh, that we talk about uh, requirements of a license. So if you look online at, at any license or if you talk about license, you often talk about, well, um, if you want to use software which is, has a license, uh, let's say the GPL, then um, there are certain restri restrictions and requirements here if the user have, has to, uh, have to meet because, so that you can, can use it. And um, yes, that's, that's certainly true. Um, for example, um, let, when we talk about GPR, for, uh, um, then there's certainly the restriction that uh, you, if you hand over your project based on the GPL something um, and hand it over as a binary source, then you also need to uh, redistribute the source code. So this is a restriction put on any user by this license. And of course, as a, a developer, as someone who starts this project, um, I can make use of these requirements to, um, well, for example, for GPL, you would usually say that the requirement that the source code has to be uh, provided as well would, well, ensure openness or ensure freedom. At least that's what the Free Software Foundation and, um, always said is uh, the whole GPL concept is about. So um, you, as someone who chooses this license, uh, can use these restrictions for your purpose and can make use of it that, that it fits 
your your project and um, this is certainly a strong point about uh, licenses but the thing is and that's something I find is often forgotten it's not the only thing licenses are about um, because not only are there requirements uh, these licenses uh, come with but also you have some insurances usually and insurances means that, for example, uh, if I let, let's put uh, stay with the GPL. If I hand you a piece of software which is licensed GPL, then you can use it today, and you can use it tomorrow, and you can use it in ten years still. And I, as a developer who handed you this, cannot just say, uh, "Well, I've decided to to make it closed source now, and uh, you have to stop using uh, this." So that's not, not how things work. So yes, uh, there are some requirements which come with licenses, but there are also insurances. And these insurances, uh, from a perspective of someone who, who uses uh, open source, and even as a developer, I mean, I'm using open source all the time, but of course, um, everyone today pulls in a lot of libraries today. I mean, that's how development today works. No one starts from scratch with assembler. Everyone pulls in everything basically today um, and uh, it would be horrible if if I start a big project on something and then two years later someone says well uh, you can't use my library anymore and it's a foundation for my project so my project would die at that point and it's funny because um, uh, a while ago I've worked for a company which had a um, had some hardware which come, came with an SDK and some some proprietary terms attached to this SDK, which was kind of necessary to use this hardware. And had in it included terms like, well, at any point of time, the uh, creator of this uh, SDK can decide that you may not, for for future purpose, redistribute this any longer. So basically. We can say that you can't use it at all anymore, and your business case is is, is void. Um, and having license which actually ensures that this cannot happen is a really powerful thing. So, um, if you think about it that way as a developer, then uh, licenses uh, do not only become this this horrible thing we have to deal with but also ensure that we actually can work with uh, stuff, not only today, but in the future. And looking at this uh, this way really makes makes licensing a little bit more, more fun than uh, just have to deal, having to deal with legal stuff. At least that's for me, and that's, that's why I um, not like to deal with it, but at least uh, I see that it's, it's necessary and uh, it's a good thing to spend this half an hour to, to think about a license for a new project. So this is about licenses in general. Um, and now uh, I thought I wanted to, to end upbeat, so I start with bad ideas and come to good ideas. Um, so I've brought you a few examples of things you really shouldn't try to do. I mean, there are always edge cases where these things might make, make sense, but in general, uh, these are bad ideas. So uh, when we start, um, well, I've already said at the beginning that custom licenses are usually bad ideas. Um, why is this usually a bad idea? Well, first of all, um, we all are not lawyers and uh, coming up with good license terms which do not offend any local laws or uh, interact badly with other licenses is not always that easy. So uh, making an error there um, could be bad and yeah, that's, that's not our expertise. So we shouldn't try to do that. Another good point is that uh, if we talk about the regular licenses, um, well, everyone kind of knows how to deal with them. And also, uh, I, even if I don't know, I usually can find resources without consulting a lawyer um, about these licenses. So I can find tons of, of information about licenses like MIT or Apache or GPL online. Um, and 
I can find, and that's something we'll see later on, really good summaries of these licenses so that I don't have to, to read through all the terms uh, and stuff like that. Um, that's not true for custom licenses anymore because that's something I have to read. That's something, if I want to use this, I have to evaluate and not evaluate once, but basically evaluate against all the other licenses out there uh, of uh, dependencies I use. So you, it becomes quite complex, even if you, as, as someone who creates a custom license, just spend five minutes to add, add one sentence because I, I felt like it. So uh, whatever you do, please avoid custom licenses. Um, there are seldom any reasons for custom license, especially in the field of open source software, because there are already a lot of well-established open source licenses out there and uh, well-established license with, with several different use cases. So selecting one of those really helps a lot, uh, really helps all of your users because it makes projects really a, a lot easier to use. And uh, again, usually there's no need for a, for a custom license because there's probably something which fits you. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not all. Um, another term which is sometimes used is, is non-commercial in, in licenses. And I can well understand the idea behind this. Um, but first of all, uh, and maybe the obvious one, is uh, usually a non-commercial clause makes your, uh, your software not free software anymore. So both, I mean, you can argue which interpretation is the correct one, the free software uh, interpretation of the Free Software Foundation or the open source interpretation of the open source initiative. But whatever way you go, uh, non-commercial is re not recognized by any of these and is usually incompatible with basically all, well, not uh, if not all, uh, open source licenses. And uh, there's another reason not to go for non-commercial. Um, because uh, defining what is commercial use and what's uh, non-commercial use isn't often that as easy as you would expect uh, would it expect to be, because uh, just uh, imagining the use case of uh, of a university. I mean, we are here at a university. Uh, they do do lectures. They uh, teach students, and usually would say, well, that's probably non-commercial use. But uh, if you think about universities, there are also uh, funded research projects often at these re universities, so they get money for, for doing some work. And this is what you would often call commercial use. And there's no definite line between this non-commercial and commercial at an at, uh, institution like this, because you have students maybe helping out with this research project, uh, people from this research project teaching. And so there's a lot of gray area uh, in, in this non-commercial field. And um, maybe a short story of, of what I would consider an extreme case of people saying that uh, commercial use is um, quite a few years ago, I think about, I don't know, t 10, 11 years ago, uh, when I was still using Delphi, some people may remember that, uh, it was it was an IDE for Object Pascal uh, from Borland, and uh, there were some, at that time, not so small communities around this, and uh, there was something called uh, Delphi Personal Edition. So um, uh, an IDE, which was nice, uh, which you could, could use for personal, non-commercial use. And there was some discussion in the uh, community about what this non-commercial actually meant. And since the, the community had a very well uh, established um, line basically to, to Borland, they asked Borland and basically their lawyers to get a proper explanation about this. And the interesting perspective from Borland, or their response was, well, um, 
of course, you can use it to build your own software and use it for your own use. But uh, if you already uh, put it up on your website, well, you're basically uh, endorsing or make um, ad you're advertising yourself, and uh, that can basically raise your value. So that's already commercial use, even though I would not get any money directly for this. I'm uh, handing out the software, this compiled software for free. Um, and I'm not sure if they would uh, have won any court cases with that interpretation, but I think it shows how, how far such an interpretation can go and why it may not always be a good idea to have this commercial clause. Um, a good alternative to these commercial clauses is often uh, to use uh, stricter GPL-type licenses, uh, which ensure that uh, you can always get uh, to any modified uh, source code. So even if some, some company grabs your code and uh, modifies this and try to sell it as a product, uh, you still have access to this. It's still publicly available and you can say, well, Either now I start selling it myself and can say, hey, I'm the original author, so you can hand off to, uh, your money to this, this, this weird entity which tries to sell this, or you can hand the uh, same money to me. Um, and this is something that often works better than, than non-commercial clauses. So, second bad idea, um, custom licenses and non-commercial. And uh, in a way, this is an, a non honorable mention, uh, especially because it's about software. Creative Commons uh, is something which is very well established in the line of, uh, of licenses, of media licenses, I should say. Um, and it's very popular on the internet. They did an extremely great job, or so I think, um, when it comes to to licensing in general, they make made very good licenses. They made the accompanying websites to well very easy to understand uh, how these licenses work. But the thing is, uh, all of the Creative Commons licenses are not meant for software, and uh, they are. I mean, I've just quoted the FAQ to say, uh, well, there there are better ways to use, uh, license something than Creative Commons. And uh, the thing is, if you look at any of the um, bigger uh, open source foundations out there, for example, uh, Apache or or um, Free Software Foundation, they usually have a list of compatible licenses with their license, so GPL or Apache. And really, basically none of the uh, Creative Commons licenses are uh, what they consider to be compatible with their licenses. So um, they are not very well uh, used uh, in, in the area of software. So please do avoid that. And really, the only license that would be recognized by those entities is actually CC0, which is the license. I've, I'm not sure if I've ever seen it in action. Uh, it's very much like a public domain. Um, so yeah, all the usual ones are usually bad ideas for software. Although, really, I'd, I'd like to stress, for media, they're great licenses, just not for software. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's enough uh, about bad ideas. So let's, let's take a look at what are actually good recommendations or good ideas for, um, for, uh, for licenses and for licensing. And uh, one of the uh, most obvious things I would say is use one of the big licenses out there. Um, it kind of I don't know, for me it sounds obvious, but it's uh, when you think about these custom licenses I mentioned earlier, um, really um, it's, it's the same argument here. Um, if you go with uh, one of the big licenses, then it's very likely that a lot of developers already know this license and know how to, to handle this, know how to deal with it. Um, if I'm part of a, a bigger open source project, they often have lists of licenses which do work with, the, with your, your uh, own license. Um, so uh, that makes this very easy for developers 
um, to to handle projects license like this. And um, I don't know. For example, uh, the biggest open source book I just wor uh, currently work in. If someone came to me and asked me, "Can I use the MIT license?" Uh, well, that's that's a no-brainer for me. I can just say yes, because I've encountered this probably a hundred times in our dependencies, and I really know that that's okay. But if someone comes with is with a very small or very weird license, then um, well, I don't know, and uh, you need to to try to find out if that's okay or not. So. It's a very good idea to, to just pick one of the big licenses, and even there you have usually enough variety so that you can pick whatever uh, direction you want to go in. So, yeah, that's, that's the first one. And um, I've brought some data with me. This is actually a few years old, so that is from 2015. Uh, it's based on uh, GitHub's data for, for licenses. So of all of the GitHub projects out there, um, if you look at it, more than three quarters of, of it are basically covered by three licenses. Uh, or, well, actually, it technically these are four licenses because these are uh, uh, GPL 2 and 3. So, uh, yeah, there are two iterations of kind of the same license, but if you're strict, of course, these are two licenses. But still, uh, more than three quarter, and if you just uh, be roughly know what these are about, you already know um, what most um, of the projects on GitHub use. So that's that's really nice. And if you can pick one of these big licenses, then the chances are very, very high that uh, other people know how to deal with your project as well. So again, a very good idea. Um, another thing is uh, if you uh, are operating in a special community or a, a special field of interest, um, then it may be that a, a big license globally is not a big license in your local community. Um, a very good example is, is NPM. If you look at licenses of uh, any of the NPM, so of any of the JavaScript libraries, then you have a, a very high chance that uh, these are licensed, one of two licenses, these are MIT or AC, uh, without actually say so I actually don't have any data to back this up. It's just my guess from, from looking at projects that most are actually today using MIT. And um, if you build something in a community like that, where you see, okay, everyone else does, does this, it's often a good idea to do the same if you don't have any special reason uh, to do something else. So just go with uh, what the others use as well. Um, you're pretty safe doing that. And uh, yeah, I mean, of course, there can be a special case where you need something from uh, which only another license provides, but for a lot of projects, uh, yeah, ju just go with what you, what your community uses, and um, from experience and, and talking about uh, with other people, especially with with smaller projects, I think it's often that people don't really care about the specifics um, of of licensing, and to, so picking just the license which everyone else uses is a good idea there. So um, yeah, these are two ideas. Uh, to go with. Um, yeah, another thing is, of course, um, that you should think a little bit about the use case um, where your software is used, because uh, licenses software, I mean, we've talked earlier about restrictions. And uh, especially if you think about these restrictions, you, there can be some problems when you pick a certain license and want to use it in a certain context. Um, let me give you an example. If you pick GPL, one of the most common uh, or most um, obvious, I would say, features about GPL or, um, is that you, it's a copyleft license. So if you modify the code, then you still need to to use the same license for these modifications. And in fact, of GPL, um, 
so not GL, LGPL, but GPL. Uh, if you uh, use a library which is GPL licensed, so include it in any way in your project, then your project needs to become uh, GPL as well. So if you want to, to write a license, uh, sorry, <laughs> a, a library, um, which you hope that a lot of people want, uh, will use this and uh, you want this to be used in a lot of different projects. Well, licensing it GPL um, makes it incompatible with a lot of projects and a lot of use cases. So, um, yeah, just giving it a little bit of thought uh, if you really need this restriction um, really makes sense in, in these cases. And uh, so, um, in a lot of cases, I would say for li for libraries, uh, GPL isn't the best li license out there, for example. Um, obviously, again, there can be special cases. Uh, there can be the case that, yeah, you, you really want to ensure that, uh, I don't know, uh, freedom spreads uh, or something like that is probably what uh, the GNU uh, folks would say. Um, then you can pick that, but but usually I would say it, it's not. So think a little bit about the use, use case. Um, look around you and, and use uh, one of the big licenses. These are, are really things to consider wh when it comes to, to all of these licenses, and uh, which are usually good ideas. Um, a final remark on good ideas is less about picking your license, uh, more about um, making it easy to find and identify your project as being under a specific license for other people. Because, um, yeah, uh, as I said, uh, I'm working in open source for quite a while now. I've had to evaluate a lot of different libraries and check if they're okay for us to use. Um, people came to me with licenses and other projects uh, which I kind of had to decide if that's okay. And uh, it's always really awful if you you can't just look at it and see what the license is. So sometimes people tend to put it, I don't know, on on, on a sub page on their website or uh, uh, packaged in their the tour ball. So you need to download and basically install the app to find out what the license is. It's, that's very, uh, well, unhelpful. I would say. Um, so please try to avoid that and good recommendations are usually if you have any project with which lives in, in Git or uh, I don't know, GitHub or Bitbucket or, or GitLab, um, having a, a just a simple license file is usually a good idea because that's where really all of the projects put their licenses. So you can just uh, take a look at that and and know what the license is. And another thing which is kind of based on this is that if you look at the big platforms like GitHub, um, if you apply your license properly, uh, they will actually pick up your license and display that as, as part of the information about your project. And ensuring that this works, and that's usually not hard to do because, uh, again, these are, they're usually just scanning these uh, licensing files. Um, but ensuring that this works really helps because I can just go to the GitHub page, uh, look at the top right corner, see, okay, this is licensed, I don't know, Apache version 2, and then I know what, what uh, legal stuff I have to deal with or not. Um, so, uh, yeah, to, to sum up the, the good ideas here, um, really pick, pick one of the big ones, um, look around here, um, don't... Uh, think a little bit about the use cases and finally uh, make sure that people can find your license. And really, if you turn it around, don't try to build anything special uh, if you can't, uh, can avoid that. Um, for this talk, I don't want to go into specifics or at least not into too many specific licenses because really, if I now go to, I don't know, 
10 or 20 licenses, and yes, there are, there are 100 licenses out there, um, you will probably just forget that. So uh, really, I have some links at the end uh, of tools or a list uh, where you can find out a little bit more about licenses, but I just want to highlight uh, the two biggest ones, which are Amity and GPL, and maybe I give uh, Apache an honorable, uh, or an honorable mention. Um, yeah, so let's talk about the most popular one according to, to GitHub, that's MIT. Um, MIT is really one of the simplest licenses that you can apply, uh, which has barely any restrictions. Um, so if you uh, say, well, I don't really care how my code is used, uh, MIT is actually a good choice. Um, the only restriction is that if someone uses your code and includes that uh, and redistributes that, um, there needs to be uh, the copyright notice preserved and the license preserved. So this is the full set of requirements, basically. Um, so uh, not very strict. Um, it's also very short, so I could have probably put the whole license here on, uh, on the slide. Um, that's definitely not true for the licenses like Apache or like like GPL. Um, and it's a very good choice if you just want, don't really care how people use the project, uh, you just want it to be usable. And yeah, so, so this is the license number one. And uh, as an honorable mention, um, uh, if you look at the Apache license, or specifically Apache versus version two, um, which was the other big license uh, in there uh, in, in GitHub, or the third one, the biggest one, if you combine GPL version two and three. Um, it's funny that it's probably 10 times the length of the MIT license, but the terms and conditions are roughly the same. <laughs> so uh, it's a lot more detailed, a lot of I don't know, let's say lawyer talk. Um, there are a few special things when it comes to, to uh, usage of, of patterns and uh, of trademarks, uh, but it's, it's roughly the same. Uh, but that's just an honor mention because uh, it's often that you encounter Apache. So um, really the hard restrictions are usually again um, that you need to include uh, the copyright notice and the license. Um, yeah, and the second one, and this is really a set of licenses because there is uh, this ranges from the lesser strict LGPL to the very strict uh, AGPL, and of course the, there's the GPL. Um, just has a different idea about licensing. And the big idea here is that you have a copyleft license, which means that um, if you modify the, co modify the code, if you add some new code to this project, then uh, this new code should be redistributed uh, under the same term. So uh, if I add some code to a GPL project, this code would also be uh, GPL licensed or needs to be GPL licensed automatically. Um, and this is something that has a special purpose, of course, because uh, in a way that ensures that uh, this still is open even if people redistribute this. So um, no one can really say, okay, I'm, I'm not closing this. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot, by the way, uh, another restriction on this is that if someone hands some, someone uh, a copy of, your, of this project in a binary form, it always needs to uh, also include the, the source code, or at least the, the purpose in getting this binary form uh, needs to be able to get the source code, so you don't necessarily have to hand it over uh, at the same time, but uh, they should be able to, to get this uh, specific version of the source code. Um, so yeah, that's, um, and these two things uh, together ensure that um, even if you, you hand this over and uh, other people modify this, um, you can still basically, everyone who gets, gets this binary project uh, has access to the source code and no one really can decide, okay, no, I'm closing this uh, project, I'm just redistributing the, the binary form, I'm, um, I don't know, selling the binary form, but 
do not hand out the, the source code. So this is one of the main big ideas behind behind GPL, and that's what um, the Free Software Foundation usually uh, calls uh, ensuring freedom, because no one can close it down. Of course, this puts some more restrictions on, on the use, so you can argue that, well, it has more restrictions than uh, uh, MIT, so it's less, less free, but uh, these are really philosophical arguments <laughs> I don't want to go into. Um, a short mention about the difference between LGPL, GPL, and AGPL. Um, if you start with the, the less stricter one, so uh, if you take, or, or, let's start with GPL. If you take GPL, uh, build a library uh, uh, SGPL, and then someone else includes that library, um, this this uh, license is basically infectious and it infects the main project as well. So the main project also needs to be GPL. LGPL is less strict in the sense that yes, if someone really modifies this this core project, then the uh, same license applies. But if someone is basically just using that, uh, including this as, as a uh, library, then it doesn't apply and, and you can still license your uh, main project differently. And um, going to the other extreme, um, if you again look at GPL, I need to hand you the source code if I hand you the binary. And uh, if you take, I mean, GPL is a few years old now, and back at the days where, where people would distribute software by, I don't know, handing over floppy disks, um, you would always have this, this binary form and then the source code. But in today's day and age, uh, a lot happens in the cloud, whatever you call cloud, but it uh, means that people usually just are using software. They are not running the software themselves anymore. And while um, GPL means that you only need to hand over the source code when uh, you hand over the binary, uh, AGPL takes us a step further and uh, if you're a user of a project um, which is licensed AGPL, you should be able to get access to the source code even if it's run in by a company on, on some cloud infrastructure or whatever. So, I don't know, if Facebook runs an AGPL project, I can ask Facebook to give me the code. Uh, so, it's the other extreme. And yeah, so just knowing this this little bit about uh, um, the ideas behind GPL, I think already helps to understand what these licenses are about. Yeah, and then uh, knowing a little bit about about MIT, which I guess is the most popular one, um, already helps a lot when it comes to licenses. When when going around GitHub and um, learning or looking at different projects. So, yeah, that's it for examples because, yeah, again, you probably are bored already and I don't want to bore you with specifics for a thousand uh, different projects. Um, instead, I want to, to go through a few resources um, which you, basically, if you forget everything I said earlier because you, you start to doze off uh, because I'm talking too long, I don't know. Um, this is uh, what you can look up later and which uh, are resources which really help you to uh, simply uh, and easily find out about uh, what some specific license is about or uh, what, something which helps you select a license and, and stuff like that. So, um, first project which uh, definitely should get a mention is uh, choosealicense.com. Um, it's a project started by GitHub, um, which uh, does a great uh, job of really summarizing licenses. So uh, it tells you well the conditions for this license are, and, and then you get uh, just a few bullet points uh, and not a long legal text, of course. Uh, there are special cases. It's basically the same thing with the, uh, uh, as we have with this talk. Um, but for getting an idea what a license is about, that's a very good website. 
and it provides as well a kind of uh, a license picker so if you go to that website you will see that okay um, your intention behind this project is this well you want to pick this license your intention behind this project is this other thing well you pick, want to pick that license you're part of uh, a community and this is one of your communities um, well you might want to go with this license so uh, they really help in both choosing a license and if you want to know uh, specifics about a license again it really helps and even though uh, the the summaries are i think also part of github so if you i think if you click on uh, a license in github um at least these the short ones uh, identified by github then you will also get these summaries um yeah so definitely a great resource and basically the go-to website uh, i would say when when it comes to all these licenses um if you're part of a specific organization um like like for example apache all these uh, organizations often have lists of compatible licenses when it comes to their license so if you are using for example the apache license you can just go to the website of the apache foundation uh, and they have a list of licenses which they, they had lawyers check that they are really compatible. So if any other project is uh, mentioned or the license of any other project is mentioned in this list, it's pretty safe to just use that. So this is also a very good resource. And of course, it's not only the Apache Software Foundation which has something like that, but you can also go to the Free Software Foundation's website and they have a list like that. So again, if you're using GPL, you would go there and then check which project or which licenses are OK and which are not. Um, again, that, that really helps, though usually if you, you played around or you read through this once or twice, uh, when it comes to the big license, you usually uh, well, know that after after you go there once or twice because they are so common and that's again a reason for picking one of these big ones um, that you you see them all the time. So uh, still, the, these licenses are good, especially when it comes to less common ones. Um, and then I'd like to mention a project which, uh, to be honest, I only found out uh, about this project. Uh, I think one and a half weeks ago. So um, I haven't tried this too much and I was wondering if I should mention it at all or not. And in the end, I decided to uh, to just talk about uh, being a little bit cautious with this, but it seems to do a great job. But uh, there are also, uh, well, there's a restriction of only uh, being allowed to, uh, without paying them, to scan five uh, projects, um, but still they, they do a great job of scanning all your dependencies and uh, building a good report and uh, identifying possible uh, license problems in your dependencies. And if you have a, especially a big project, um, I thought it, it can be helpful, so I, I'm uh, mentioning them here. Um, and uh, yeah, just scan your project, which uh, if it's hosted on GitHub, and and you see if if they find something. And indeed, uh, the project I tried this on, uh, I identified really one license which was clearly incompatible with with uh, the license the project uses. Um, so in the project, there's uh, an open discussion right now how to get away from that because uh, it's it's a clear legal issue for example so i thought i yeah just just mentioned this um yeah if you manage to doze off at at any time during this talk uh, the two key takeaways for for this talk i guess are these um so uh, first of all yes please apply license uh Please do not just leave your code uh, on, on GitHub without uh, any license because it basically makes uh, this project unusable for everyone. And uh, if you really don't care, um, my recommendation is just, I don't know, pick MIT attaches, don't think about it too much and that's okay. Um, but 
whatever you do, please apply a license. And if you, you want to choose a license, it's a really good idea to, to pick one of the big ones out there. Um, yeah, so if you remember nothing else, uh, th these are two points which are well remembered, I think. Yeah, that's, that's it. So I hope you've learned a little bit about licensing. Um, and I hope you've learned that you don't need to be a legal expert to, to make a good effort. Again, there are special cases where we definitely need lawyers, I think. Um, <laughs> even though I'd like to avoid them. <laughs> but, but yes, they are, um, you can make an effort and avoid a lot of problems if you if you just try to to do a good good job of of deciding uh, what licenses to use and um, if you check once if you can use a project um yeah that's that's it